Hello, and welcome to today's City Club of Boise virtual forum with the candidates for Boise City Council. I'm Dr. Stephanie Witt, professor in the School of Public Service at Boise State University and today's moderator. I want to welcome our radio listeners who will be joining us via Boise State Public Radio on KBSX 91.5 and its affiliates throughout Southern Idaho and Northern Nevada. This program is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel as well. Today's forum is brought to you as a special partnership between City Club of Boise and the League of Women Voters of Idaho, Greater Boise area. This is made possible in large part because of our City Club partners and sponsors. Our premier sponsor is Northwest Nazarene University and the NNU College of Business. Our annual sponsor is the University of Idaho. We also receive support from our forum series sponsors, AARP Idaho, Bank of Idaho, Climatech Corporation, Echelon Group, Micron, Pacific Source Health Plans, Small Mind Development, and St. Luke's Health System. City Club of Boise receives grant funding from the Idaho Humanities Council. Thanks also to our media partners, which include Boise State Public Radio, 670 KBOI, Idaho Statesman, and Idaho Public Television, and our university partners, Boise State University and Northwest Nazarene University. We would like to acknowledge the ancestral, cultural, traditional, and unceded territory of the Shoshone, Bannock, and Northern Paiute peoples on which we are meeting today. Please remember that there will be an opportunity for our panel to respond to your questions today. You can use the question answer function of Zoom, just type your question in, or you can email it to Morgan, M-O-R-G-A-N, at cityclubofboise.org, and it will be provided to me. I'll do my best to present each question and may group similar inquiries together in the interest of time. Each candidate will have two minutes to respond to the question posed to them. We reserve the right to mute any candidate who exceeds the time limit for opening statements of one minute or response to questions at two minutes. This forum will be organized as such. Each candidate will provide a one minute introduction. Then we'll pose questions for each candidate to answer grouped by district, starting with district one. As a reminder and short civics lesson, during the 2020 legislative session, the state passed a bill HB 413 requiring cities with populations over 100,000 people to create districts for city council elections. For the upcoming 2021 election, Boise City Council seats one, three, and five will be up for election using the new geographic districts and for two year terms. We'll post a link in the chat to a City of Boise tool so that you can look up your district. District one will respond to questions for 15 minutes, district three for 25 minutes and district five for 25 minutes, simply because there are more candidates in district three and five. All candidates will have, have been invited to participate and one candidate did not respond. We'll then wrap up and close the program at 1.30. Let's begin. The order of introduction and opening statements was determined by a number draw. I'll call on each candidate by name and you have one minute for your opening remarks. Nicholas Domini, you are first. Hi there, thank you. Uh, so my name's Nicholas Domini. I've been in the city of Boise uh, for 31 years, grew up here. I'm a, I've been in the army for 12 years. I'm a drill sergeant and uh, a local unit out in Gowan. I'm a small business owner of two businesses, one called Myth Parkour and another one called Mythic Meadery. Um, Run for city council, I believe that I'd be a good candidate because I have uh, what it takes to really push through with the missions I've gone with the military and with all the community outreach that I've done through local out outreach. Thank you. Our next candidate is Crispin Gravatt. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. My name is Crispin Gravatt, and I'm running for city council in District 5. And I'm running because I really want to have a long and fruitful life here in Boise, just like so many of us do. And over the past couple of years, as I've been out having conversations with my neighbors all over town, I've heard a lot about some of the growing pains that we're experiencing here in the city of Boise. Uh, but where we have these growing pains, I see incredible opportunity to jump on these growing pains and make some really positive change for our community. 
Uh, my day job is in education, where I've learned to build really effective community partnerships and boost the involvement of people from all backgrounds. As the chair of the Public Works Commission, I've seen some really creative ways that we can protect our land, water, and air. As an artist, I really want to support the arts and take our scene to the next level uh, to make us world class. And then as a renter and a young professional, I see an opportunity for us to boost wages while we work on long-term housing solutions and grow in a way that fits us all. I'm so excited to do all this and serve you on the Boise City Council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Lisa Sanchez. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa Sanchez. I currently serve as the president pro tem of the Boise City Council. As far as I know, I'm the only I'm the first woman of color to hold a leadership role uh, on this council. And uh, it is a huge honor to be able to serve also as the first, and I believe the only renter so far to serve on council. As many of you may know, our city is being comprised of growing numbers of renters. I think right now the number is between 43 and 50% of the people who live in Boise are renters. So it is an important demographic to have at the decision-making table. Um, I grew up in Burley, Idaho. I moved to Boise in 1989 to attend Boise State University, uh, where I dipped my toe into politics for the first time. I was the first Latina uh, to serve as student body vice president and then president, and then it would take another 25 years for me to enter politics again. But similar to Crispin, um, for me, it's about how our city is evolving, and it is important in my belief that we have a diverse group of people at the decision-making table and that we be transparent about the work that we do at the city. Uh, the work that leaders, uh, the, the policy that leaders put in place has a real effect on every member of our community. And I, I would say it's the most vulnerable members of our community that I am advocating for and that I represent. Again, as the person of color, a member of the working poor class, and also a renter. And that has been the work that I've done at the city of Boise. I've put forward a the, the, the initial work of a strategic plan for diversity, inclusion, and equity, and a rental application fee ordinance in 2019 with the support of my fellow council members. I just want to continue doing good work on behalf of the people of Boise. Next, we have Steve Madden. This forum today. Welcome to all the other candidates. Uh, my name is Steve Madden. I'm 66 years old. I'm retired. Um, I live in the East End. My wife and I have been here from California for about three years. Uh, I'm a registered Republican, but I really identify myself as a conservative. Uh, that allow, for that reason, I believe in uh, a real true representative government, which I really don't think we have in Boise right now. I think our, our government is very uh, lopsided and one party ruled, and I'd like to see that change. That's why I support HB 413 and uh, redistricting the city uh, so that the people who represent uh, people in, in their districts actually live there. I think uh, the closer government is to people they represent, the more effective they can be. Um, that way you have access to your representative, your voice can be heard a, a little bit readily. Um, what I've noticed in the three years I've been here, um, after being in construction for pretty much 30 years of my life, um, I see the, the pace of growth here is, in my assessment, a little bit out of control. Uh, there's a lot of growing pains, like Crispin said, about uh, what's happening within the city. And um, the people that live here now are the ones that are suffering from that. Uh, in, in the effort to attract more citizens here and grow the city, the people that actually live here now are, are really having to deal with it, the impact of all that. Um, heavy traffic, a lot of congestion. Um, I think uh, neighborhoods are a little less safe than they were a couple of years ago. And uh, I think the things like public safety and infrastructure and um, keeping pace with uh, maintaining public works is really difficult when you have the kind of, of, of construction and the kind of developments going on right now. I'd like to see a little, I'd like to see that looked at a little bit more carefully with the impact on current citizens really the focus. Um, Thank you. Uh, next we'll hear from Greg McMillan. Um, first of all, thank you for having me here today. I appreciate the, the time and the opportunity to, uh, uh, to be part of the discussion. Uh, my name is Greg McMillan. Um, I'm actually from Boise. I've been here since 1976. I went to uh, school pretty much within District 3 at 
uh, Highlands Elementary, then I went to North Junior High, Boise High School. Um, I graduated at the University of Idaho with a degree in accounting and then also have a degree or have an MBA from Boise State University as well. So Vandals and Broncos together. Um, the reason I'm running and the reason I'm here today is because um, it feels like there's a, a strong disconnect between City Hall and uh, the residents and not being heard, uh, not getting a voice in front of some pretty big issues that we're in front of and um, getting opinions, but not getting an opportunity to pr provide their input into, you know, what direction the city is actually going to go. Uh, things I think that are important to me would be public safety is number one, uh, support of our uh, police and fire and EMS. Uh, another one that's top of mind is housing, it's, which I think, you know, all of us will probably touch on today is that, you know, the city's growing, it's growing quickly. Uh, we need to make sure there's uh, a place and a space for everyone and make sure that um, we're retaining a high quality of life in, um, in a city that we all love. Uh, along those lines as well, um, keep an eye on transportation and making sure that people can get, you know, across the city. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, going from the west to the east, north to the south, making sure that people can get safely, you know, to and from where they need to go, whether they're in their car, on a bus, riding their bike, uh, or walking. Uh, I want to make sure that that's uh, something, you know, we, we pay close attention to. Um, the last one would be property taxes. And there are some things we can do as far as property taxes are um, when we're, we're pulling, pulling those property taxes from uh, our residents. We want to make sure we're stewards of those uh, monies to make sure that we're spending them wisely and that we're not. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, gentle reminder that you have one minute for your opening statements. And next, we're up to Laura Metzler. Good afternoon. My name is Laura Metzler, and I lived in Boise for 50 years, 30 years of that time. I'm in my, I am married. I have two adult children that are currently living out of state. I decided to run for the Boise, um, oh, I'm a retired postal worker. I um, had a 30-year career with the U.S. Postal Service. I decided to run for the um, Boise City Council because I love Boise. I've, uh, I've remained active within the community. I believe that it's important to give back to the community. So I have served in volunteer um, capacity in a nu numerous ways, everything from planting wild grasses at the Hyatt Hidden Lakes Reserve to um, volunteering for, for doing um, the legwork of setup. Um, I've, I've um, hosted foreign exchange students. I've, um, I coach girls little league at one point. So um, these are the things that I feel that are really important in living in a, in a city like Boise. I, I love this community. Um, even though I've been retired, I try to remain active because I, I do want to make sure that um, we continue to have that friendly, um, vibrant, uh, welcoming community that I love. And um, so um, I can get into my issues, but I'm gonna leave it at that right now. Thank you. Next is Katie Fight. Thank you for this opportunity. I believe this election is about the heart and soul of our community. Boise is at a crossroads. Many people feel like they can no longer really afford to stay in their homes. Some are even living in their cars. We need immediate solutions. Things like home sharing, tiny homes, potential mobile home areas to address the immediate housing needs, as well as longer term, larger projects. Also very concerned because it turns out our parkland is not secure. And there are those who might seek to dispose of our parkland. And I also think people need a greater voice at city council meetings and will work for an open public comment period at every city council meeting. I'm a biologist, I have a master's degree in biology from Utah State. I worked for Fish and Game for around a decade on wildlife habitat projects in Southwest Idaho with landowners and agencies. For the past 20 years, I worked for environmental nonprofits on complex public lands issues, including keeping public lands whole and in public hands. Um, and I've spoken up time after time for issues of importance to me across the city 
the Blue Valley Diesel Terminal, um, the Boise Avenue Apartments, the F-35s. And I believe I have the combination of skills and perspective and tenacity to really make a difference to Boise at this crucial time in our city. Next, we have Lucy Willits. Thank you to the City Club and the League of Women Voters. Uh, this is so important because it gives us an opportunity to have conversation and civil discourse, and that's what we should be modeling in our capital city. So thank you. You know, this is a historic election because we actually have zones now where we have dedicated representatives representatives in each of our areas. And I want to be that representative for West Boise. West Boise is extremely unique within the city. We border three other cities, Eagle, Meridian, and Garden, uh, Garden City. And we need somebody who can be effective um, and has the experience to effectively represent our area. Uh, I ran because I love this city. I've lived here for two decades and uh, I wanna keep Boise, Boise and its uniqueness. I have a couple of issues that I'm gravely concerned about. Um, first of all is public safety. We wanna keep our city safe and clean. Second of all, I wanna be, like I said, that dedicated representative to the city, to the West Boise because we feel left out and we don't want our voice lost and we need somebody with the strength to make sure that our voice isn't lost. And I think I just got to think for time's up. Is that it? Am I done? All right, I'll cut it off. Thank you, Lucy. Next we have Maria Santa Cruz Cernic. Hi, my name is Maria Santa Cruz Cernic and I am a transplant from Seattle, Washington. I moved here in 2000, April of 2000. And um, I started uh, thinking about being a, a candidate because of my customers. I own Stag Hair Care. I've had it for since 2007. So I'm a businesswoman. I've had other several businesses. I still do catering for Filipino food and I've had a coffee shop. And um, right now I'm also the president of the Boise Treasure Valley Seahawkers, which we are committed to doing fundraisers for the, for the community. And our claim to fame is an Easter egg hunt for the, for the women and children's city light shelters. So all the kids could come out and all they have to do is donate canned goods to enter the the, the race. In any case, um, I have a lot of, of uh, experience in business and I have a lot of solutions and also personal life experiences where I could uh, uh, initiate a couple of things about housing. Whereas when I moved here, I was on section eight, but I didn't know that it was transferable from Washington and it was. And, but the only thing was that they only had apartments and there was no homeowners that were on the program. And they said, you know, if you could find somebody, good luck. And I was able to find my very first house and the lady that uh, signed up was able to uh, be on the program, her house passed. So this, this issue I would like to have presented to more ho homeowners to join in on the program so that people that can't afford the full amount of rent is gonna be helped by the government and have it subsidized. And Okay, uh, thank you, Maria. Our next candidate is Holly Woodings. Thank you so much and uh, thank you for having me today. My name is Holly Woodings. I'm a member of the City Club of Boise. And so I really appreciate this forum put on with the League of Women Voters. I've worked on the City Council for the past four years with a focus on small business, sustainability and smart growth strategies to pre preserve the things that we love about our city and make sure that we're also able to make room for new neighbors. I went to college here. I grew up here in District 5. I've lived many places, both as a renter and a homeowner in this district. And I know that it's um, such a vibrant part of Boise with so many unique communities that deserve a seat at the table. My kids go to school here. My family owns a business here. So we really have a lot of skin in the game to make sure that Boise stays a vibrant place where our kids can grow up and hopefully um, start their own businesses and have their own families. So thank you so much. I really appreciate everyone involved in having us here today. Thank you. That's, uh, that completes our introductory statements from candidates from 
seats one, three, and five. We will now begin um, asking questions of the candidates for District 1, uh, Lucy Willits and Laura Metzler. And um, I'm going to start you off with a fairly general question. What is the biggest challenge facing your district? You will have two minutes to respond. Um, Lucy Willits, would you begin, please? Yeah, I, I get the pleasure of going first. Uh, I think the biggest challenge in my district right now is feeling a part of Boise. You know, people live here, they love it here, but they often feel like they're left out and that their voice isn't heard. You know, like I said before, we have a really unique dynamic in, in this part of Boise and you can metaphorically throw a rock to Garden City, a rock to Eagle and a rock to Meridian. And we do our shopping and our entertaining all in these four cities, including Boise. And as I knock on doors, people are like, oh yeah, we, we vote for city council. And it's like, yes, you do. And so I think that's part of the system that the legislature was trying to correct was to give people a voice. Our, um, our voting record in West Boise isn't great. Less than 20% usually vote in city elections. So feeling part of Boise is an important piece. I think that's why this election is so important. So people feel like they have somebody that they can go to, to express their concerns. Uh, from an issue side, other than visibility and recognition and having a voice, I think people are concerned about public safety. They see the community growing. They wonder if those needs are being met across the board. You know, there's there's the common concern about growth and, and the community changing. But really, from a West Boise perspective, it's just trying to make sure that we're heard and that we're recognized and and build up that in that community engagement. Thank you. Laura Metzler, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing your district? It's growth. Um, we are, are as we, we are between downtown Boise and Meridian and um, growth right now is, is moving out of the downtown core into West Boise. See, um, I, I've knocked on doors um, and, and I ran for the Senate seat in 2016. And I knocked on um, close to almost 5,000 doors. So during that time, I got a really good feel for the people who live in my neighborhood. I've talked to them about the things that they, they are concerned. And um, it, they seem to fall under growth. And, and growth is a, is a big umbrella. You know, it, it covers traffic, um, uh, um, safety, you know, um, and um, um, housing, housing, um, density growth coming out our way. So we're seeing it and with another thing that we, we um, experienced is um, in my district is wells drying up. Now I know these are private wells and, and really don't, don't relate to city um, other than infrastructure that would, may be possible down the road, but that's also falls into the growth um, categories. So um, the that I, when I talk to residents in this district and I'm out there again knocking on the doors and, and they seem to be um, expressing the same um, worries, those are the things that, that um, I feel right now are, are of, of the most concerned. Okay, thank you. This is the first election that we will have representation by districts as opposed to at large. And so I'm wondering about your representation style. Uh, do you see yourself as primarily an advocate for the district or for the city at a whole? And how do you balance that out? Why don't we start with Laura on this and alternate who goes first? Well, like you said, it's balance, balance. Um, I, I in, in up the districts the way they did, obviously um, the idea is that I will represent the people in my district, but we are a part of the city of Boise. So we have to plan together, work together and come to the sensible and reasonable um, plans for not just the residents, but also um, the city of Boise as a whole. So um, I don't um, I don't see my Myself is regular per se. You know, I, I think that there's there is balance. I'm, I'm a I'm a big person. I ran on balance. That was the my um, my campaign um, because it's necessary. You know, you no no one you can't do one way. You have to be able to work together to solve issues that are 
and you have to use sensibility, common sense, um, um, reasonable um, plans to bring associated problems that we are facing. Thank you, Lucy Willits. Unmute yourself, please. Thank you. That's a great question. And I think it's a question that every elected official and a republic deals with. Because if you are if you are elected as a representative, you go to represent your district or your legislative area or your state, and then you have to balance the needs of your country, your state, and your community, your city as a whole. So it's this is not uncharted territory. I think the difference is, is that it's new to us in the city of Boise. But what I would say is when all of Boise prospers, every part of Boise prospers. So you do have to look at issues at a whole, but I will tell you from my, my perspective, my number one priority is to the constituents of West Boise. They're the ones who elect me. They're the ones who employ me. They're the ones who need the voice. And certainly as every issue comes up, I'll look at how it affects the city, but I want to hear from them primarily because they're the ones who voted me in. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, many people have mentioned uh, issues around housing. Could you describe what specific actions you would like the city to take in terms of housing affordability? And we'll start with Lucy Willits on this. Yeah, that this is, I think, the toughest question of all, because if we would have figured it out, we would have figured it out already. <laughs> um, we've had steady growth in this valley for 40 years. Uh, the pandemic was like a tsunami. Suddenly anyone who wanted to move to Boise seemed like they did. And it's it's outpriced so many people. Um, it's become more like California, where if you're in the market, you're you're going to do fine. But if you're not, it's almost impossible to get in. Um I do not profess to have the answers to these questions. What I would like to do is learn and hear from others and see what is possible. The only way that I see at the point from a big picture perspective is supply and demand. You have to have more ability to have more housing so that you can get the price down. Now, this isn't just a Boise issue either, and Boise can't take this on as our as our only mission. I mean, this the, we are a regional metro center. We are the Treasure Valley. This is a Caldwell issue, a Nampa issue, a Meridian issue, an Eagle issue, a CUNA issue. So this isn't just about more housing and opportunities in Boise. It's about the region. Um, but we live in a supply and demand economy, and we need to recognize that that's part of it. Um, so I'm learning. I, I want to help. But I think if, if, we, if we knew the answer, we would have fixed it by now. OK. Laura Metzler, your thoughts on uh, housing affordability that cities could take? I, I agree with Lucy that it's supply and demand. but. Um, Property owners' rights also come with um, wages. Are wages keeping up with um, with the rising cost of, of living? We know we need enough. We need a livable wage. It's not an easy answer, as Lucy said. There's a number of, of uh, factors that play into affordability. Um, it, is it is a is rent affordable if the if the uh, property owner raises a rent every six months? I have friends that actually experienced that this past year. Finally, one one of my friends finally left the city. She could she was on a on a um, fixed income, and for her, with each um, rent increase, it priced her out. So um, I understand that this is not just a, a one. Um, solution, but um, I'm willing to work also with, with um, different people. I'm hoping right now that, that, that the supply and demand is, is kind of alleviating some of the rising costs right now. I saw, I read a little bit about um, recently some, some new um, statistics coming out saying that it seems like leveling out. So I'm hopeful for that. But like I said, property owner rights come into play, livable wages come into play. Those are the things that will always come into play of, of Boise being a livable city. Uh, one of our um, listeners has asked about uh, the city's policies towards climate change. Do you believe the city has a role in adopting policies related to climate change? And Laura, we'll start with you to alternate. 
Yes, I do. I do. I believe in climate change. As I said, I, um, in my district, we're experiencing directly right now what um, a long, hot, dry summer means. Um, we also had probably one of the longest smokiest summers that I have seen. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, um, a big fan of our open spaces and, and um, so I'm a big fan of our outdoors. And when I see um, our, I know this is not so much a city, but it will come into play for, for homes border on the foothills. Um, but with the fire seasons being lasting longer, there is a problem. So I do believe that the city's on the right course to addressing these, and I want to continue to address um, climate change issues. It's important. It's not, it may not so much right now, but we're definitely going to see the need for it in the future. And any planning that we do now has to take the future into consideration. Thank you. Lucy Willits, does the city have a, a role in climate change policy? Yes. Uh, so I believe in climate change. I've seen it in my own experience in my life. Um, but here's what I think we need to look at is the return on investment. So we can we can do things in the city of Boise that are more green. And I think there's a lot of things that we've done. I mean, I personally love the recycling program. I love the compost program. It makes me feel better. I am very diligent about those things. The question is, what is the cost of going above and beyond that? And what's the cost of the taxpayers? So as a fiscal conservative, I, I would like to look at the return on investment. It might make us feel better, but is it going to actually help the climate because we're just one little space of this? And uh, like I said, we can feel better about it, but the question is, what is it costing the city of Boise? And when we talk about climate change, it's the entire world. And we've got, you've got to have good actors in every place. So when I look at these things, I'm going to be looking at them from the, from the view of the taxpayer is what's the return on investment and what are we getting out of this? And if it's costing the city more, then I think we have to have a conversation about that. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more. Is that correct? Um, okay. So uh, next question is about the sewer bond measures that are on the ballot. We've had several questions from uh, the audience about this. Do you support the city going forward with bonds for the sewer infrastructure? Uh, and a related question is why we aren't using the federal funding given in response to uh, COVID to deal with that. So Lucy, if you'll start there, please. So I'm going to vote against the uh, water slash sewer bond. Um, I think bonding is the right way to go. It's a lot of money. It's a half a billion dollars. And the city council made the decision to bond over time versus dumping some cash in at the beginning. But I'll go back to my original statement. Statement: People in West Boise are don't even know there's an election, let alone that they're going to have their taxes raised. And so I would like to see more conversation, more need about the sewer bond before we pass it. My experience in government is sometimes you have to fail at the beginning to retool to get a better policy and a better outcome. And so I'll be voting against it. And uh, I will view it as my job to dig into these this issue and then educate my district for the next time around on why this bond may or may not be needed. Okay, thank you. Uh, Laura Metzler, your view on the sewer bond. Voting for it. The reason why I'm voting for it is because um, yes, it's expensive. We know it's expensive, but we all have infrastructure that is um, going to fail or needs replacement. What it costs us today, what it's going to cost us down the road is needs to be taken into consideration. I see, you know, um, it's never easy to put money up front, um, but in the long run, we're probably better off in saving money in doing so, because from experience, the way the more expensive it gets to, to, to um, get the same bang for your buck. So um, I'm voting for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a reminder to our radio listeners that you are listening to a virtual forum featuring candidates for the Boise City Council 
presented by the City Club of Boise and the League of Women Voters of Idaho. Next, we will be moving to our candidates for seat three, uh, Nicholas Domini, Maria Santa Cruz Cernic, Lisa Sanchez, and Greg McMillan. Um, we will start with uh, Nick Domini. Um, and could you tell us what you think the biggest challenge facing your district is? In reminder, you have two minutes. All right. Uh, so part of what I believe makes up the main problem for District 3 is going to be infrastructure. We have a lot of new houses coming in, uh, not enough road work being done, especially on the more west side, closer to Eagle and Garden City. A lot is being created, but the infrastructure isn't there yet. I think that we need to start focusing on getting our roads there, making sure we're planning everything out that we need to, because we are growing, uh, everything's changing. Uh, like we just had the wildfires that happened off of Hill Road that was literally about five minutes from my house. I, I think we need to be more precautious on what we're doing, where we're going with everything and just kind of plan it out better. Uh, other than that, I think the housing crisis is a big issue. I'm a big proponent for the Ballard Point that is off of State Street. I think it was an amazing project. I would like to see more of those projects come into play. Uh, it was one where houses, homeless vets or veterans who are uh, just down their luck or have issues. And I think seeing more of that would definitely help out a lot with our community and showing that we do support the men and women who actually fight for us and do the day to day. Another one is just taking care of the community. Uh, parks are a big one. I know right off of Gary Lane, there's a giant empty slot of space that's doing absolutely nothing. It's been there for years. I'd love to see that turn into a park, uh, maybe even a fire station. There's not a fire station too close to that part of town. So those are just a few of the things I think we need to focus on and really grasp tight. So I will stop there. Thank you. Uh, Maria Santa Cruz Cernic, could you talk about the biggest challenge for your district? I think right now our biggest challenge is the, the shelter that's going to be placed on uh, on State Street. There's a lot of contention that, um, well, the people that I spoke to, they felt that it was being undermined, that they kind of went through the back door. And for the most part, they just wished they had known about it before they made the decision and had more input on it. And as far as the safety, safetyness of the facility, um, combining all the different uh, groups of homelessness, it's, it's not a very good situation to go in on. Aside from that, um, I can't remember the lady's name that, uh, is it Jody? I can't remember who owns IFS, but um, prior to the sanctuary closing, she had some issues that she needed to address. And before that was addressed, she had closed it. And so going forward, if she hasn't fixed those problems, they're gonna still be there. And so that's, for me, I think we need to address also the kind of facility she's going to be upkeeping if she hasn't even fixed the ones from before. So, and there is a lot of uh, people that are against this. And for me, I'm still waiting on finalization because I'm not sure if it's complete yet, but uh, we'll just have to see. Thank you. Next, uh, Lisa Sanchez, the biggest challenge facing your district. I would say it's a challenge and an opportunity. Um, I am on record as not being uh, supportive of us moving to this district um, set up simply because uh, I think it may, it may make it more difficult for people like myself to be able to secure a seat on the Boise City Council. And I think it's important that we have a diverse representation um, at the decision-making table. That being said, we do have districts now. And so I embrace this opportunity uh, to approach this work, uh, knowing that I will be voted from a geographic area. And so one of the most significant challenges that I think our area face, faces is how do we change and evolve? Because that is inevitable. We change and evolve as a community. And how do we do that in a way where we're still preserving those elements of our community that we uh, value and hold high. Um, 
as Maria mentioned, we have some changes that are gonna be, that are being considered for our district. The possible move of interfaith sanctuary, that is not a done deal at this point. Um, we do have some proposed improvements to the State Street Corridor to address some of the issues that, um, that Nick brought up. At the end of the day, what we need to be is collaborative with the other districts because as Laura mentioned, we are still one city. We are part of a larger community. And just because District 3 ends um, at a certain street, that doesn't mean that our community is going to have different issues. We are all going to be in this together. And I think the challenge is gonna be is how do we then not become territorial about our district and the needs of our district? Um, that's not how I've done my work over the past four years. It has been about the issues. For example, we have renters. Okay, sorry, I think we uh, hit the time limit there. Thank you, uh, Lisa Sanchez. Next is Greg McMillan. Could you identify the biggest challenge facing uh, your district, please? For sure, thanks, Stephanie. Um, I think it's a very common theme through Boise, but I, in District 3, you know, what we're seeing it too is housing and making sure that we can find opportunities for um, everybody that's looking to put a roof over their head and having um, a variety of products that we can do that with. And that's, you know, going from all the way out on Old State Street, all the way down into the North End. And I think it's something that we're going to have to work with um, as a city and then also working with, uh, you know, public and private partnerships to ensure that we can create the density I think that we're gonna need, but also doing it in a way that uh, preserves the neighborhoods that we have in place today. Um, because, you know, the, the culture that we have and uh, the quality of life that we have in a lot of these neighborhoods, we enjoy. Um, but we absolutely have to, to find a way to um, give opportunities to whether it's say a renter, a first home buyer, uh, whether it's somebody who's uh, experiencing homelessness, you know, and then along with that uh, comes the infrastructure and looking at to make sure that, uh, you know, as council, we can approve developments, but we have to make sure that infrastructure stays ahead of it so that we're not finding ourselves in a situation where suddenly we don't have uh, coverage from a fire perspective or a police perspective. Um, so I guess for me, those are the ones, that's the one thing that, and I think it's important throughout Boise, but especially in District 3. So, um, I'll, I'll let uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, our next question is something some of you've touched on uh, already, but could you describe your representative style? Uh, do you see yourself mostly as an advocate for your district or for the city at large? And Maria Santa Cruz Cernic, we're going to start with you. Okay. Well, um, I can see myself doing both, being able to. Uh, include others around me because what happens in our district is also going to be effective elsewhere. So to be more cohesive, we should be able to talk to each other amongst the, the other districts. And um, going forward, I'm thinking that uh, as a representative of our district, that we should be able to have either monthly meetings or quarterly meetings with all the associate heads or even just an, an open um, meeting so that as a representative going into meetings at the city hall, I would have a lot more information to, to, to have gathered and share with others. And possibly, I mean, I think, I think it'd be a great idea if all the other members of, of representatives could get together collectively as well. So um, I think over, we're overthinking that I think as a city, we have to be able to communicate with each other. So that's the best way to do it. Okay. Having served for four years, um, it has been fascinating to see the different ways that we interact uh, with our constituents. Uh, when I first uh, arrived on council, our then council president, uh, Laura McClain initiated um, town hall meetings and those were wonderful. Unfortunately, we, wouldn't, we couldn't really continue those in 2020 just because of COVID and the safety issues, but I know that we've embraced uh, using uh, 
tools like this, webinars and that sort of thing to be able to communicate with folks. But as I stated in my earlier response, the work that I've done has really been about issues and issues that affect uh, the entire community. And so, but I do embrace this opportunity to do a deeper dive into this geographic area that is now known as District 3. I think it'll present a unique opportunity uh, to have deeper connections uh, with my neighbors. Um, I've lived in the North End for nine years. And, and the only reason I'm able to do this is because I have a benevolent landlord who doesn't choose to charge me what she could raised, based on market rate. And so it would be fascinating to be able to do a deeper dive in and to be able to connect more closely with my neighbors. Um, but I still feel those issues are citywide and we need to keep that in balance as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Greg McMillan, you're next on um, your representational style. Um, thanks again, Stephanie, I appreciated that. And I think what I'm seeing is we need change. Um, there's not enough communication between uh, the neighborhoods uh, within within the district. And specifically, I'm hearing this as you go from, uh, you know, all the way from, again, West End to East End. And I think it's important that, you know, from a representational perspective, my first representation, First thing I need to do is make sure that I'm keeping the interests of District 3 in mind. Uh, those are the people that put you in office. Those are the people you need to listen to. Uh, making sure you're talking to uh, Sunset, uh, Veterans Park, Collister, North End, um, moving up in the foothills. Um, everybody has a voice and everybody has a perspective on what's important to them, to the city. Um, thereafter, I think it's really important that we all work together. It's the city of Boise. Um, and everything is in interconnected and there's no way that you can have uh, make a change in one area without having an impact in another and you have to it all have to be connected anyways I mean just thinking of a simple thing like transportation so um, again my goal would be to make sure that I'm connecting with the community making sure that they are heard making sure that their voice uh, reaches down into city hall thank you and finally Nicholas uh, or Nick Domini uh, your thoughts on your representational style. Uh, so I would definitely take into consideration that obviously District 3 is the one who elected me, but if we're doing something that deals specifically with the neighborhood, then it makes sense to start from the inside and you start working your way out. So if that neighborhood is putting in or doing something to the road, that want to know what their thoughts are and then start to expand out. So major projects will have to be in the District 3 will expand to other sections of Boise. So it makes sense that we have to be able to communicate with other parts of Boise and make sure that we're not impacting them as well and vice versa. So in order to make sure that our communities are strong and we're together, we need to make sure that we're still working together. But on simple things that are just down the road, maybe it's best just for this uh, district three, but then if it works really well, tell every other district how we did this. So it's never good to exclude anybody. It's never good to, just keep to yourself. We need to come together as a community. I've lived in the 06, 05, 09, 02, uh, 14, all over Boise. I've grown up here. I've gone to schools all over the place. I can tell you there has been a lot of um, community and a lot of just togetherness. And I think if we keep that strong and we keep moving forward on that, then we'll be one of the best cities in the country. That's it. Thank you. Uh our next question is about housing affordability, and we will begin with Lisa Sanchez. Could you talk about specific ideas you have that you believe the city should consider for increasing the affordability of housing or the amount of affordable housing, depending on how you say that? <laughs> yeah, um, housing has been a major focus of mine, specifically as it relates to renters. Um, as I shared in my introduction, um, it is a growing segment of our city and one that I don't think gets a lot of representation. We tend to focus a lot on the needs of property owners. And I used to be a property owner. I, I owned one of those controversial tall skinny houses uh, 20 years ago. Uh, there was a lot of pushback about that housing product um, being introduced into established neighborhoods, but I was a very happy homeowner for nine years until I lost my home to foreclosure in the Great Recession, and so I've been a renter ever since. But I appreciate bringing that, per, that dual perspective to City Council, where we do make decisions every week about how we use our land. And I have to say, I, 
it is painful at times to hear uh, property owners uh, speak disparagingly about renters. And right now I'd say they're the most vulnerable members of our community. The volatility of the rental market is uh, really painful. It's something that I can relate to with my constituents. And so for that reason, I have focused on addressing the issues of the exploitation that our renters go through at the rental application phase. We passed that ordinance in 2019, and there was a move to overturn that ordinance at the Idaho State Legislature this year in HB 45, which we were successful uh, in killing. But what I think we need to do is develop relationships with socially responsible developers. I do believe they're out there. We need to be creative about who we invite to build in our community. We cannot have people who are solely driven by profit. We need folks entering into this sphere who truly want to provide affordable housing for our community. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is, uh, we'll go to Greg McMillan to talk about your ideas about uh, housing affordability in Boise. Um, thanks again, Stephanie. Um, I think, you know, at the root of, you know, providing affordable housing, it's, it does come down to supply and demand and creating more supply. Um, and then getting that product to market quickly. Um, one of the issues I think that I've been hearing in talking, you know, to uh, the developer community about, you know, what can they do to help in this regard is to make sure that uh, there's enough resources down in planning and development services. Uh, the time that it's taking to get um, new, new projects approved is, you know, even just a simple home for that example, is used upwards of about three times, which you might see even in uh, across State Street over in Meridian. So I think it's something we could do really quickly is to make sure that we have the resources necessary in that department to approve, uh, to review and approve the uh, projects that are in front of us to help uh, ease up on that, um, up on, ease up on the need. Uh, we also need to make sure that we are providing them with clear lanes to work in. Um, uh, developers can be very efficient, but I think it's important that we make sure that they have a, a clear set of rules to play by and then and let them do their thing. Um, if we can do that, they'll create more supply, which in theory is gonna uh, provide more product and reduce costs uh, as well. Um, the other thing I think we need to also be thinking about is creating better jobs and more jobs in Boise. Um, you know, rents and, and property prices will continue to go up, but if we can provide people more opportunities, provide uh, they're providing them with a, a higher level of income. I think that'll help ease that as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we go to Nicholas uh, Domini. Nick, um, your thoughts about housing affordability? Yeah, uh, so I grew up here. It was incredibly difficult for me to jump in and buy a home. I actually had to deploy to the Middle East just so I could raise up enough money. So when I got here, I was able to afford a home, uh, which I don't think we should be trying to send away people or people shouldn't have to leave the country to go make money just to come back to their hometown to be able to buy a home. So it's definitely a big issue. And it's one that many of my friends uh, are struggling with right now. And I, I agree with uh, Lisa and with Greg that, you know, we need better jobs out there. Uh, we need to be able to protect renters so that way they're not getting forced out of their homes just so we can get other people in there. I, it's just coming down to building more homes and making it more affordable for people, uh, everybody to buy a home. And one of the stigmas growing up here was like, oh, you need this certain type of job or you need this kind of job or you need to be able to have this much money saved up. Maybe if we had programs to help people, obviously if you're able to afford a rental, you're paying $1,600 for, and then the home mortgage is $1,200. Why are we not allowing them to be able to buy those type of homes. So maybe uh, doing more outreach and helping those who are struggling with buying a home and just being out there, uh, finding the new locations. That's about it, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, finally, uh, Maria, could you tell us your thoughts on housing affordability? Well, um, this is actually my very first home that I, I bought with my husband. I was 40 years old. Prior to that, I was a single mom, could never, I would never be able to see myself buying a house. And so I was always a renter, apartments, especially in Seattle, and uh, couldn't stay there long enough. 
um, always had to leave nine months a year because of all just stuff going on. But in any case, um, I think some of the root of the problems of this affordable housing is from out of state buyers and they are outbidding the locals. And I, I, I find that kind of a bitter taste in my mouth when I hear that, that they, that uh, the locals can't find a house because out of state people are buying it because they have the money. That doesn't seem fair to me. I don't know how to make that better because I know a sale is a sale. But the second thing I was thinking is that we need to have a small village of tiny houses that is affordable. I mean, if you make a big uh, subdivision just like Avamore with tiny houses, that would be great. It's affordable. And I do believe there was a, a, an article about a, um, a builder in Garden City that just made one, but she can't live in it because of the ordinance or that it is considered an RV. So I think maybe we should change some of those um, protocols and have it be able to live in and not be considered an RV. So it could be permanent. It'll be so much cheaper for people to be buying a, uh, for starter homes. So that's my ideas. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our next question is about the uh, wisdom of the sewer bond facing uh, voters this election and the financing done by the city for that. Uh, Greg, you are first, Mr. McMillan. All right, thank you much. Um, it, that's a, it's a big number. I mean, half a billion dollars is a, uh, not an insignificant uh, amount of money. And I think it's something that we really need to take a close look at. Um, and I think, you know, the comments that Lucy had made is in terms of looking at uh, the options we have today, which is to say, you know, cash up front or, or credit or long term. I, I really feel like there's other opportunities to find funding uh, from a federal perspective that should be explored a little bit further before moving forward. Um, I fully recognize that we have to have an infrastructure that uh, accommodates the need today as well as uh, down the road. But um, I, I do think that it's important that we explore all options and just pause a little bit before we decide, yes, we're gonna move forward and, uh, and take that leap. So I guess, you know, what I would tell you at this point, my vote would probably be no on the sewer bond. Um, and hopefully raising, you know, some uh, additional conversations around what else could we do to, to lessen the load um, for, uh, for homeowners and, uh, and renters as well, because it's, it, all is just, it, it all will come out in uh, either your mortgage or your rent one way or the other. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nick Dominey, your thoughts on the sewer bond? Uh, so I'm going to be completely honest. I don't know a terrible lot about it, and I will speak to what I have heard that if it's going to help us grow in the future, it's definitely something we need to look into. And like Greg said, there's probably government funding out there. I know that we're the new administration is trying really hard to push for the climate change, and that they're giving um, out allocations of money to help with changing the city and how things are run. So if it's a way to help improve our city and how we go about with the sewer, then I think. That is something to look at. Um, other than that, I can't, like I said, speak too in depth on it. I don't want to give any wrong opinions on that, but it's definitely, uh, it helps with the future Then I think we need to look closer into it, but maybe not just this moment. Thank you. Uh, Maria, Santa Cruz Cernic, your thoughts on the sewer bond? Ugh. Well, I'm still, I'm at a crossroads with it. It is a lot of money. And but I'm in an area in the Northwest Boise that it actually affects us a lot. Um, the water keeps backing up into the sewer systems. Uh, it's in our in our uh, it, it floods our grasses, and then they have this new subdivision or or the prominence over here that's going to be being built. So I know it's needed, but the prices is kind of is a little outrageous. I need to do a little bit more re research on it, but it is needed. But again, it's, uh, it's a lot of money. So I, I'd have to still think about it. I, had, I haven't made up my mind yet, so. Okay. Lisa Sanchez, your thoughts on the sewer bond? 
I'm one of the council liaisons to our public works commission. And so uh, for the past four years, uh, one of the things that I've really drilled on is as we do any improvements uh, to our systems that we need to be mindful of the folks in our community who live on fixed incomes um, for whom a change in a fee could be really problematic for them. So um, I think part of the thought process in choosing this particular approach is, is for that concern to be addressed. And it's important that everybody pay into this system. Um, if we were to pay for this right up front, our rates would go up at a significant rate. It could be really devastating for many members of our community. And so yes, we may pay more over time, but at least everyone will be paying into the system. And it's my understanding that even if we pass this bond, uh, work will continue to see if there are other fund funding sources that would be available to offset those costs. So I am uh, very much in support of the bond. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to remind our radio listeners that you are listening to a virtual forum featuring candidates for Boise City Council presented by the City Club of Boise and the League of Women Voters of Idaho. Thank you to our candidates from seat three. Uh, it's now time for us to uh, move our questioning to the candidates for seat five. Those candidates again are Steve Madden, Holly Woodings, Katie Fight, and Jay Crispin Gavat. So uh, let's start with uh, what you think the biggest challenge is facing your district. And we'll start with Steve, if we could. If Steve Madden, are you there? Back, get myself back online here. <laughs> are we back? Yes. Okay, good. You know, District 5 is, uh, it's an interesting district. There's neighborhoods in it. I, I live down in the Warm Springs end of it in, in the East End. And there we go. Am I still here? Cool. So, um, but it also includes the whole downtown corridor. It includes the Boise bench. It includes a uh, traffic uh, corridor out to the airport. And it, um, it's, it's a complicated place. Um, most of the development that's happening in, in downtown is in District 5 at the moment. And um, people coming and going through there is, is a congestion uh, problem. Um, where I live, I live off Warm Springs Avenue. And our, our particular neighborhood, just in the last couple of three years, has become very congested with people uh, driving through from Park Center and down from the highway and on out to Harris Ranch. Uh, it's a two-lane road, in and out. Uh, it's very busy during the commute hours. And uh, so traffic and traffic patterns are, are an important part of e even the residential areas. Uh, downtown's very complicated with all the uh, construction that's going on, road closures, lane closures, uh, projects, uh, one-way streets closed, two-way streets closed. Um, it, it's a difficult, um, it's, it's a balancing act for a lot of people that have to go in and out of town every day. Um, the, um, the, other, uh, the other thing that's threatening, I think more, uh, it's more threatening to me is it's preservation of our open space. Um, a couple of months ago, uh, the city sent a consultant firm around, uh, around it through our neighborhood, at least looking at all of the city properties and the potential for building uh, high density housing, uh, low income housing. And they, they actually looked at the Lower Moore uh, Arboretum as a, as a potential site for um, high density housing in a neighborhood where there's uh, very restricted traffic flow, a lot of um, multi-unit housing already, and it would have been a complete disaster to allow something like that to happen. And, and even for the city to consider that, to me, is, is pretty reckless. Um, okay. Uh, Steve, just a reminder that we can hear you perfectly, but we cannot see you. So when we come around to you on the next question, um, you know, play with the video and we'll see if we can, we can get you there. Uh, Holly Woodings, you're next on Biggest Challenge Facing the Newly Created District 5. Thank you so much. Um, I really think that the top issue facing our district is affordability. Um, we have a lack of workforce housing. We also have the highest concentration of employment in the city, in this district. So we need to be creating opportunities 
for folks to live close to where they work. Um, that makes it more affordable in a few ways. You don't have as much expense in transportation. Um, you have other options for that. And, um, and you just build more thriving neighborhoods when folks don't have to rely on cars to get around. Um, and I think that that's a big focus is how do we make our district more affordable for folks? Um, and that comes down to increasing our housing stock, um, making sure that neighborhoods are connected and making sure that we have new employment opportunities that are paying a living wage um, so that people can live close to where they work. Thank you. Thank you. Katie Fight. your uh, ideas about the biggest challenge facing District 5. Thank you. Well, again, um, it's housing and, uh, and affordability overall. We need to quit tearing down our existing affordable housing. When the city grants a rezone to a developer inv or investor, the city needs to require that affordable, ha affordable housing be part of the package. The city has the leverage to do that. Time after time, it's not happening. It didn't happen with the torn down Travis Apartments, beautiful Art Deco historical building in, um, on 17th and Bannock. Um, we lost affordable housing there and we lost a, a beautiful building with no affordable housing in return. It didn't happen with the Boise Avenue apartments, also in District 5, where Big Judge, the Maverick, beautiful trees and an established affordable housing rental site. We could have had the best of both worlds. We could have had high density development on the Big Judge and Maverick site. We could have had a pocket park preserving the trees for health, the health and well-being of the folks will, that will be living in the high density student housing and the neighborhood, and also to help protect our cooling urban canopy that's very important in um, sustainability and climate change. And we could have retained existing affordable housing and perhaps built more on the site. But instead, the city didn't use the leverage it had there to do something really good for the community as a whole. Um, earlier, I talked about um, home sharing, the, the potential for, even though they aren't perfect, RV parks and other, and, and tiny homes as well for immediate solutions for people who need help now, as well as working on longer term projects that truly. Okay, thank you, Katie, for your thoughts on that. Next, we have Crispin Gravatt uh, talking about the biggest challenge in District 5. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I'm the only renter running in this seat. And as a renter, I've had the unique opportunity to live in just about every neighborhood in District 5 as I've chased affordability over the years. Uh, and so I've not just heard about these experiences, I've actually lived what these top issues are. And the top issue really comes down to growth and how we're managing growth. Growth is putting a strain on the quality of our water, our air, and access to our public spaces. Uh, water quality up on the bench. I had brown water issues when I lived off Morris Hill. Uh, we've had a smokier summer than ever, and there are things that we can do about that. Growth is also putting a strain on affordability broadly considered. As a young professional, I know that wages aren't keeping up with the cost of living. Uh, and there are ways that we can tackle that. I also know that the cost of living is growing. And that is a, a lot because of the demand that we have for housing. Now we need uh, more collaborative solutions long-term, but we need to make sure that nobody is left out in the middle while we work on these affordability concerns. And lastly, as I've been reaching out to neighbors all over town over the past several years, growth is putting a strain on public trust. People have growing concerns uh, and don't know where to point their frustrations or their hopes and dreams for the future of this city. And I hope to play a role to engage neighborhood associations and foster more creative and more effective public input as we tackle our rezone, as we tackle our redistricting and other issues into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Crispin. Uh, 
Our next question is about your representative style, uh, given that we now have districts as opposed to at-large seats for the city council. Uh, we'll start with Holly Woodings. Could you tell us about how you plan to handle this change? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, as someone who used to serve in the legislature, I'm really familiar with needing to represent a district while still keeping the larger picture in mind. Um, one of, and I was a vocal opponent to the legislature of districting, preferring to have this conversation as a city rather than it being a mandate from um, the state. But I think one of the silver linings of this has been the ability to really engage with neighborhood associations and others in a way that is dif honestly difficult as a representative of an entire city. We have so many neighborhood associations with very distinct needs and interests, and this has really made it easier to get to know exactly what those are um, without um, needing to meet with every single neighborhood association in the entire city of Boise. So with that in mind, I would really look forward to the opportunity to engage more deeply with the neighborhood associations in District 5 and constituents in District 5 while still bringing that perspective more globally to the entire city of Boise. We all have the same issues. We have the same challenges. We want the same things for vibrant neighborhoods. And I think that we can do that by working together. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Katie Fight uh, about your ideas on representing a district versus the city. You're uh, muted still, Katie. Could you start over, please? Yes, thank you. Well, District 5 is a great district. It's the most diverse district by far. Every issue in the city is on the forefront. And I have so enjoyed walking around the neighborhoods, talking to folks and seeing what's on their minds and, and, and looking at the pro and hearing about the problems and concerns in the neighborhoods. And there's so much, so much similarity between neighborhoods, between the bench and between the East End with problems like traffic, where we have a bus system that ridership has been stagnant. It hasn't, it hasn't increased in decades. I think we need to really look at changing that and have a more agile, smaller fleet of buses that operate longer and go deeper into the neighborhoods. And that that will help affordability and um, the city as a whole and the environmental issues associated with pollution. But beyond that, as a biologist and ecologist, you know, every, in my work, everything is interconnected and certainly our air sheds are interconnected. Uh, even it turns out our sewer system is interconnected. And from my neighborhood behind the federal building, sewer pipes could go under the river eventually. So I learned that from the folks tearing up the streets by my house. But beyond that, um, the city of Boise right now needs to work together and I believe the voices of the individual neighborhood associations and the voices of individuals need to be heard. And that's one of the reasons I really would like to see a 30 minute open public comment period at every city council meeting. That way, not just the person representing the district, but all the city council members could hear what's on people's minds, hear their ideas. And I think this will help unify the city. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Crispin Gravat, could you tell us your thoughts on your representational style? Absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, I recognize that the issues don't fundamentally change because I live across the street from somebody in another district. So to be clear, my role on the city council is would be, as a representative for the district, to engage members of my district more actively and more effectively and take the input, the concerns, the hopes, and the dreams that we have for our city to city council and negotiate the best path forward for the city as a whole. Uh, also, I really hope to, in the next two years, uh, really engage members of my district and lead the way for other city council members to engage their districts in 
what is the most effective way to redraw this map to better represent us and our issues uh, in a way that we can collaborate together? Also looking at uh, engaging on some of the things that impact our city as a whole. As a representative for the district, I really hope to hear some of the unique concerns that we have about the way that our land and housing and our economic development is being conducted in the city of Boise since we are such a central hub. I want to gather our input on these issues and whatever comes up over the next couple of years to really be the voice on city council for this district, working collaboratively with my friends on city council uh, to find the solution that best fits the city of Boise. Uh, I want to avoid any sort of uh, confrontation or gridlock and my skills in collaboration that I got from my job in education, I think are the best, most prime way to facilitate those conversations. Thank you. Uh, Steve Madden, your thoughts on representing a district and the city. Steve, you're muted. There we go. I have audio. My video is still not working. Okay. So, um, I would, uh, well, back to the original question. I would be a district representative first and uh, a city, uh, and, but the city needs second. Um, I am, um, I'm the precinct committeeman for the GOP in District 5. So I have 13 other precincts besides the one I live in that I have to coordinate with and talk to and, and help um, Republicans and conservatives in my area uh, keep up with what's happening politically. Uh, the same model would be used um, in the districts, um, it, within the district with the neighborhood associations and um, uh, the people that live here. The, um, one, one thing I would like to do, and, and I'll do this in my district, is I, I would, um, establish a citizen advisory committee or a citizen advisory council. And those people, uh, we would draw from the different precincts within the, the, the city, within the district, and uh, have regular meetings so that you can have uh, conversations with the folks that you're representing. And um, help them understand that it's not just the needs of that district that are so paramount, it's the whole city that's involved. Uh, try to educate them about um, other things that are going on around the city. Uh, that may or may not affect them directly, but they have to consider when they're um, deciding uh, what kind of um, uh, communication they want to have with the city council. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I, I want to engage as many people as possible in the process, give them a sense of, of ownership and the decision-making around the city. Uh, things that we, the city, the decisions we make now are going to impact the, the future of the city for years. And it's important that uh, everybody on both sides of the aisle and in, in, on every, in every stripe, um, have a voice. And that's one thing that uh, a city council member can do. They can communicate with their people directly, uh, take their input, educate them about what's going on around the city that they need to consider when they're making um, whatever expectations they have and uh, do the best to communicate that with them. And then- Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, our next question is, uh, you've, you have mentioned housing several times, but let's talk about your specific ideas uh, for uh, addressing the affordability of housing issue facing the city of Boise. We'll start with Katie Fight. Well, yes, we need to stop. I believe we need to stop tearing down our existable affordable housing. As I've said before, and when the city grants a rezone, the city has the power to require that affordable housing, <coughs> excuse me, be part of what the developer has to do in order to get the rezone. And that this is critical. And that we need to also understand that this rezoning process that's underway has a potential to quickly and greatly alter our neighborhoods <coughs> as well as cut the public voice out of the process by limiting input to planning and zoning. And this will be, I believe, like pouring gasoline on our housing crisis fire because this, this, we can build our way out of this crisis. It hasn't been working, it won't work. That's the trickle down theory of affordable housing. 
But instead, as the city itself knows from a public presentation just a, a month and a half or so ago by its own housing specialists, what we're building is big unaffordable houses. What we're building in the rental market is unaffordable units for people who live on a Boise wage. Um, we're building for people who, you know, for people who are not those most in need of housing. So there's a whole suite of actions we need to be taking, some of which I've described earlier, but I, I, I need to go back and just think, hew back to Blueprint Boise, our neighborhood plans and our zoning code. That's what has guided Boise to this point that has made Boise a great and livable city that has helped us protect our parks and green space and has up until fairly recently made us an affordable city. It's okay, I think we reached our time limit there. Thank you, Katie, for uh, that answer. Next, we'll hear from uh, Crispin Gavat about uh, housing ideas. Thank you. Uh, nearly 50% of the city of Boise residents are renters. And that representation has not carried over onto city council. And that leaves a perspective gap in our leadership. As a renter myself and as a young professional, I understand and live with the constant concern that any solutions that we have related to our housing inventory, even if we could wave a magic wand and build the uh, best possible project right away, it takes years for construction to be completed. And that leaves people in the middle in this big affordability gap. So while we work on long-term solutions with more creative partnerships with other cities in the Valley, more creative partnerships with some of our benevolent uh, builders and, and contractors and uh, other, other workforce development and, and developers, we also need to make sure that people are not left out in that affordability gap, that we are raising local wages so folks can keep up while we work on these long-term solutions. Also, we need to pay special attention to those who are most impacted by housing insecurity, uh, housing insecure populations and homeless populations. One of the leading causes of housing insecurity in Boise, in Ada County broadly, is domestic violence. I want to tackle the causes of, ho of houselessness and housing insecurity at the root so that we're not dealing with it later. I've spent 10 years working on domestic violence services with law enforcement, healthcare providers, and social service providers. And I really wanna get us all on the same page to work through these issues together. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Steve Madden on um, ideas about the housing affordability. Well, thank you, Jess, Stephanie. Um, I think housing affordability has a lot to do with how much money people have in their pockets, uh, how much they can earn, how much they can keep. Um, that money, the, how much they earn, how much they keep is, is really uh, directly affected by how much their employer can pay them. So if, if, the, cost of a, if the cost of operating a business uh, goes up, uh, then, uh, and, and, you know, business owner can't afford to um, keep all the people on that they did before because their costs of operations have gone up. Um, that hurts people's ability to make income. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a function of business. Um, I'm not a big fan of things like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, minimum wage to put more money in people's pockets because I think minimum wage puts people out of work. Um, if you... Um, leverage a, a, a business owner with a minimum wage, uh, they have to let go of people because they don't have the extra money from, from their customers to be able to pay for that. Um, I think uh, other things like property taxes, impact fees, just the, the general um, cost of, of, of government on the taxpayers, uh, if there's find a way to reduce that a little bit, have more money in people's pockets, I think that would be uh, a really good start. Um, I'm not in favor of, of using tax dollars to help people with a down payment for a home. Uh, you may be able to have a, you may be able to make a, a rent payment, but you don't have the 20 or $30,000 for a down payment. Um, I don't want taxpayer dollars going to that. Taxpayer dollars should be spent 
on, on things that, that benefit the whole city, uh, not just certain individuals. Um, I'm not a fan of rent control. I think that's just, a, it's, a, uh, it's a spiral. It takes, uh, it takes the, the, the value of, of someone's property and puts it in control of the government, which I, I'm not a big fan of. Um, the city already has tools like the housing bonus ordinance that it can use to attract uh, contractors to build affordable housing, high density housing, however they want to put that. But um, those people aren't showing up here. The people that are showing up here want to build expensive condominiums and big homes out in the valley. And that's the, those are the most profitable ventures. Thank you. Uh, and finally, on this question, uh, Holly Woodings about housing affordability. Yeah, thank you. Um, Katie brought this up earlier, and we are undergoing currently a once in a generation update to our zoning code to reflect the many months of public involvement in the development of Blueprint Boise. And that happened during the last recession. I was part of that as a member of my neighborhood association at the time, the North End Neighborhood Association. And it was a robust public process where we all envisioned what we want our neighborhoods to look like into the future. And one of the things I think that's really stifled development is we don't have Blueprint Boise in code. And so what that does is it serves to um, stifle new development because it's very expensive to get a rezone. It's very expensive to come through some of the city processes that we put in place where things like higher density housing around activity centers could be in place by right. Um, and so I think that that's a really big piece to our affordable housing puzzle. Um, as Crispin said, building new takes quite a while. Um, so I don't think that it's an immediate solution, but I think that it's something that's going to benefit generations to come. Another thing that we need to look at is our transportation options. Um, if people have walkable, bikeable neighborhoods or access to public transit, they're going to have more affordability overall. And so just the other night, we were able to approve the State Street Urban Renewal District, which touches both District 5 and District 3, um, runs right through the middle of those neighborhoods. And that'll help by in, in encouraging um, transit-oriented development along the State Street, Street Corridor with mo more robust public transit options so that folks can get around easily and conveniently, as, um, as Katie pointed out. And another thing is we need to encourage employers who are coming in with living wage jobs. We've seen great success out in the Gateway East Urban Renewal District, several big new employers with um, working class jobs. Um, I'm sorry, I think I'm out of time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So we have just a few minutes left. So now you only have 30 seconds to answer uh, what your thoughts are on the sewer bond coming up in this next election. We'll start with Crispin. Uh, as a member of the Public Works Commission for the past several years, uh, as its current chair, I put a lot of work into designing this water renewal utility plan and this water renewal bond uh, that will be on the ballot. So as myself, I wholeheartedly endorse and will vote for this because this is our make or break moment. This is the, the decision between whether or not uh, we pay for growth next year or whether growth pays for itself over 20 years. Okay, thank you. And Steve, your very quick thoughts on the sewer bonds. You're muted at the moment. Okay, in the interest of time, there oh, go. there you are. Okay. There so uh, I'm a no vote on the bond. Um, the, um, there's no real scope of work in the bond. There's nothing that identifies projects that need to be done. Um, if there's um, if there's something the public works uh, department knows about what work they want to get done, I don't know if there's shovel ready stuff they want to get on top of right away. But uh, bonds for me, um, I have a I have a bad taste in my mouth about bonds coming from California. They just burden taxpayers with an enormous amount of interest and debts. Uh, that the taxpayers have to pay back. That's another way to take that uh, money comes out of people's pockets they can't spend on their own living. Okay, great. Uh, Holly Woodings, your quick take on sewer bond. Yes, I strongly encourage everyone to support the sewer bond. And one of the reasons is because 
this is just the upper limit of bonding authority. If federal funds come in through ARPA and other programs for infrastructure, those will be applied to the cost of these projects and our bonding will actually be lower. So I just wanna point that out. We'll be looking at other forms of funding while we use bonding authority to achieve the very specific projects that are outlined in the water renewal utility plan. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Katie, fight your take on sewer bonds very quickly. Yes. Well, we needed much more detailed upfront information about what would be paid for with this sewer bond. Sewer bond. I absolutely support the cleanest possible water going into the Boise River. I understand we're already paying on a, our sewer bill bills for the renovations that are taking place right now on the Lander plant and other plants. Um, there are big uncertainties, whether Boise is going to be, able to be building one or two new plants, whether we're going to have water reuse. Oh, sorry, Katie, we caught you there in the time limit. I, uh, I'd like to uh, thank our radio listeners and to our participants on this webinar that have been listening to a virtual forum featuring candidates for the Boise City Council presented by the City Club of Boise and the League of Women Voters of Idaho. My name is Stephanie Witt. I'm from Boise State University and I wanna thank uh, everybody for joining us and uh, have a good Thursday. <laughs>